The Meatballs and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, Geek Nation Tours, and by the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everybody for your continued support. We really appreciate it. The Meeples and Miniatures Podcast, episode 234. For King and Parliament. With hosts Neil Shuck, Mike Hobbs and Mike Whittaker. And guest Simon Miller. This show was recorded on the 1st of November 2017. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. My name is Neil Shuck. Welcome to the show. And on this particular episode, I am joined once again by our very own Welsh wizard. It is Mr. Michael Hobbs. Hello, sir. Hello, Neil. Hello, Meeps. And hello to the other Welsh wizard. There's another Welsh wizard? Or the, the the Wizard of Wales, as he's known. The Wizard of Wa- Oh, the Wizard of Wales. Ah, yes. yes. Mr. Statton. Mm. Who I'm meeting tomorrow, funnily enough. You're meeting tomorrow? Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. For a wizardly battle. Well, no, he's um, doing some storytelling down the road. But, yeah, no, he's doing a rendition of uh, one of Dickens' uh, short stories. Yeah, so that, that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to getting out. And the wife's looking forward to it as well, which surprised me. Although I haven't told her that he's a war gamer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll keep that one quiet over there. Yes, yes, and of course we are we are joined by our resident troubadour. It is Mister Mister Michael Whitaker. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you? Oh, you know, jogging on. How are you? How are you doing? Oh, not bad. Busy doing the things they pay me to do, like shut down Love Film. Or... You were currently playing the part of Will the last person to leave the building please turn out the lights? That, that, according to the contract, I'm about to, that, according to the agreement I'm about to might well be me. <laughs> you will be that person who will be receiving the DVD that somebody forgot to return on the uh, yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> on the last last but one day. Yeah. I forgot my hat there. Here we are, sir. Yeah. Cool. Well, welcome both, and welcome to uh, another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. Uh, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks since we've uh, be- been together and recorded, so we've got quite a bit to catch up on. In the meantime, of course, somebody because you know he's he's got bored with the fact that all of a sudden he's got he's got nothing to do on the on the odd week. He's he's gallivanting off and appearing on other podcasts, aren't you, Mister Hobbs? I did one. Isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> Because he asked me. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Hello, Mr. Arnold. So, was it? it's going to be episode 28 you're appearing on. Yes, which will probably be out before this one does. Uh, yes, quite probably, actually. Yes, quite probably. Uh, oh, cutting. Well, you know, I, I don't want to say anything, but, you know, Neil's obviously slacking. All his playing games, having fun. Yeah, I don't know. the podcast listeners. Yeah. Yes, that's terrible. Yes. It'll be up all night editing by candlelight. That's what I say. I mean, this poor Annie wants to come on the show, desperate, and we can't even fit her in until February. Yes, yeah, sorry, here, what was that what about then? She wants to come on the show. She wants to come on the show, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> uh, it'll be nice to have her on the show. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yes, I think next year will be the um, will be the returning tour of uh, of loads of people next year, and the, uh, yeah, people we, haven't, uh, we still haven't managed to catch up with for a while. I think we are fairly booked up between now and Christmas. If yeah. I remember rightly. So, you guys been busy? No, really. No? No. Work-wise, yeah. Hobby-wise, not much. I bet you might. Done a bit. Done a bit. 
couple, some interesting things happened hobby, hobby news wise uh, since we were last on. Troll Trader have taken over Drop Zone Commander and drop uh, and uh, uh, the stuff from Hawk War Games, which uh, Comes was as no surprise really. You kind of yeah, I mean you you certainly see where that's coming from, and uh, and, and knowing knowing David and uh, having spoken to David from Hawk several times. Yeah, he is very... Again, it was one of those things of getting to the point where he hadn't got time to do what he does best, which is sit down in, you know, sit down and design stuff because he was too busy uh, running the business. So I think it's... Yeah, I think it's a good move. Uh, and, yeah. and, and as I say, Troll Trader... Well, wow, they're getting, quite, they're getting quite, a port, quite a portfolio together now, aren't they? Mm. One thing didn't, they take, didn't they take over another game as well? They done kind of all relics. They took yes, uh, they took, yes, they took relics over, didn't they? Yes, yes, they did. Mm. Yes, thank goodness. Mm. Yes, so we shall have to have a chat with our mate Lewis again from uh, from from Troll Tader. I shall have to uh, uh, because I did um, when they took uh, relics over. I, I did drop him a line and said, "Oh, can we have a chat?" And he kind of went. We'll have to have a chat a bit, for, bit in the future because at the moment all we can turn around and say is that yes, we've just bought relics. <laughs> and I suppose now they can just turn around and say, yes, we just bought Drop Zone uh, and, and Drop Fleet. But uh, yes, we shall have to get um, we shall have to get our mate Lewis from Troll Trader back on the show and chat all about what's been going on with uh, what's been going on with Troll Trader. But the, yeah, it's uh, I mean. Some people, you know, people, some people weren't aware, but I mean, you know, I mean, Troll Trader are actually, as I say, I mean, you know, they're quite big in distribution and stuff, aren't they? So, uh, the people who know Troll Trader is just people who produce MDF scenery. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing an awful lot more than that. So, um, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, but no, no, it's, uh, no, it's really interesting move. So it will be good to see what happens to that, where that goes, and especially with the fact that, obviously, we've seen that uh, War Cradle have taken over some of the Spartan intellectual properties, uh, which is uh, which is good to see. So it's, yeah, it'd be good to see uh, it'd be good to see that carrying on as well. So so yeah, good stuff, good stuff, Ooh. interesting times. So we shall try and get hold of Troll Trader and talk to them about relics and drop fleet again. That will be in the new year. Uh, but it, at least it means by then we'll, uh, you know, they'll have something more to talk, talk about other than just, oh yeah, we've taken them over. Of course, yeah. it's just been uh, uh, Essen Spiel has just been on in Germany. Yes. Anybody, uh, yeah, anybody seen? Uh, anybody watch any of the co- uh, any of the coverage from Essen Spiel? I saw a tiny bit. Um, I saw some of the news from Fantasy Flight about the uh, the Legion add-ons. Yes. Um, which might be useful for Imperial Assault and 7TV and games, stuff like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I've seen, seen a lot of people on the board game UK group on Facebook coming back from Essen with stupid amounts of stuff. <laughs> As one does, yes. Yeah, um, I think we shall have to go. I mean, now... Now that especially Mr. Hobbs has been introduced into the board gaming hobby in the last year, and now he's seen, you know, he's been introduced wandering around the UK Games Expo for a day. I have to seriously, because I mean, I've never been to Essen. That's that's, that's certainly on my bucket list of uh, of something to do. So I mean, you know, going, you know, going to Germany for for four days gaming and then finding something to do in the evenings. What can possibly go wrong? Huh. No mm. comment. Beer and sausage. Mm. Be- beer and sausage, indeed. Yes. So uh, it's just the worst. Oh, oh. <laughs> <sighs> hang on. Can we? Where's that um, badum tish? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. I think. I think I shall <laughs> definitely have to find one out for that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Two tom toms and a symbol fall down the stairs. Indeed. Badum tish. Uh, badum tish. Indeed. And on that note, I think we shall. Uh, <laughs> I think we shall head towards a break and and then come back and chat about chat about what we've been up to. The eagles have gone. Britain lies defenceless in a cruel world. Since 
the birth of our Lord. It has been four hundred and fifty-six years. What sins have we committed to bring this punishment to Britain? I speak, of course, of the Saxons. They came as allies, but now they seek conquest. The land of the Britons lie ravaged before them. Blood runs red in our island. We need a leader to stand against them. We need a man to bring together the Britons in common cause. We seek a Dux Britanniarum Right, that's enough of that. Ducks Britannia are in from two fat lardies. They really are very good. What have we been playing? What have we been buying? We might even have painted something. The Meeples and Miniatures crew reveal all. We made it to the first break without any mention of cake or biscuits. What will people think of us? Oh, we, me and Jay had a good 20 minutes talking about biscuits and cake. Really? Yeah. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we we noticed that the final of have, have, have British Bake Off had a brief discussion on Dunkgate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Really? There was a brief debate between the two judges to, as to whether one should dunk. Here we go. Yeah, I am not a viewer of uh, Great British Bake Off. Let, let us just say that, that as, as a pair of clearly unimpeachable sources on British baking and eating etiquette, they were both in favour of dunking. So, yeah, for the benefit of the rest of you... Oh, oh, so, so, poor Hollywood and Prue Leith are both in, are, are in favour of dunking? Absolutely. Where does Sandy Toxfix stand on it? I don't know. I haven't asked her. She wasn't in that discussion. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I just wondered. <laughs> anyway, yes, right. Uh, so on that <clears> though, then I suppose we need to uh, we need to crack on with uh, and, and chat about what we've been up to uh, over the past and catch up with what we've been doing over the past couple of weeks. Let's do it. Indeed, right. Yeah. So let's start with a man who's been gallivanting off another podcast, shall we? <laughs> Shame, <laughs> Mister Hobbs. Shame. Yeah. Well, I've, I haven't really done much this uh, last two weeks because I've been, you know, busy prepping for uh, other podcast work. It takes your time, all this preparation and stuff. But uh, let's have a look what we've been doing. Ah, oh, Seven Continent. It's just, ah, oh, it's a game. Oh, that's a game and a half. We played a few sessions, now, me and Mark. Mm -hmm. We thought we'd almost got to the end of the first curse, which is the sort of the first scenario after after about ten hours of play. We made it to our end point. We, we found the idol that we were meant to find. And we were cold. We were hungry. We were almost dead. And we found out that we hadn't actually made it to the end and we had to do a load more other stuff. <laughs> I was going to go, no! No! <laughs> yeah. But I tell you, it, it is a formidable game. It, it just builds and builds and builds. And actually... As it's a French game, it should be a formidable, formidable, anyway, formidable, formidable. Formidable. Yeah, I can't do a French accent. Anyway, yeah, he's noticed. You yeah. should be able to do an English one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, that game just builds, and I, I love it. Really love it. I also had a game of Arkham Horror. Um, ah, right. Okay. Uh, no, we didn't finish it. We only had about, about two or three turns just to mm -hmm. try try it out. But that's another really good game. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you want to have a look at it, Mark, Neil. Just get it. It's really, really clever. <laughs> just, <get> it. <laughs> just, just get it. Just buy the base game and have a play. It, it's really, really thematic. It's, what, what's interesting is 
it, it, okay, so it's a living card game. It's by Fantasy Flight Games. It's set in the sort of Cthulhu mythos, mm. you know, in the 20s. You're investigators. So you have your scenario, which is sort of played over three acts, shall we say. In, in each act, you're trying to achieve certain names so you can move on the story. But on the other side, you've got this sort of anti-scenario, which also is played in three acts. And that's... and. So you're trying to push your agenda forward by trying to, and also trying to stop the other agenda from um, taking control, shall we say, or yeah. meeting meeting its logical end. And it just builds and builds, and you just go insane, and things bad things happen, and it's it's really immersive. It's a fantastic game. Um, I actually think it's a better. Some some of the mechanics in there are better than Lord of the Rings card game. Yeah, it's, it's sort of up to the next level. Which would so. kind of make sense because it's kind of the second gen. It's kind of the second mm. generation after um, after yeah, because it came after Lord of the Rings, and it's it's another one of the cooperative set of games. So it yeah. kind of makes sense. It kind of moves it on a bit. Mm. But it's very very clever. Good game. I really enjoyed that game. That's about all I've been really been playing. Uh, I've been painting a bit. Mm-hmm. I'm doing horses for my Rohan army. Horses. horses! Oh, yes. yes. I finally oh, ran out of excuses yeah. not to do horses, so I've done 20 of them. And I've got another 12 on the paint desk, which are half finished. So, And then I've got another uh, 14 to do after that. So you started doing black ones? Yeah, I did the black ones first. They're easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, start with the easy ones. Get the quick wins in first, that's what I say. <laughs> now I'm doing... I've done, and I've done chestnuts and bays next, so... Good sort of uh, twenty odd of those will be bays, and and that just leaves then the twelve, which I'll do a variety of sort of different colours. Some you know, might be some palominos, some chestnuts, some. Go for a bloody shouldered grey. They're always fun. Yeah, I might do some greys as well. I like I like grey horses. There's a, there's a nice there's a nice thing that happens to greys as they get older, where some of the the red of the original coat colour comes back through. Oh, right. Which is what gets you a flea bitten coat. But there's a really classic sort of extreme case of it called the bloody shouldered grey, where most of the front of the horse goes back back to being brown. They look really spectacular as a hero horse. Ooh. I shall I shall take out some pickies and all I do do a couple of those. They're they're on my blog. I I think I covered most of the one most of them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so painting time is going going quite well. Buying stuff. What have I bought? Mm. Um Okay, so it's two weeks, so, you know. Um, I, I have backed the Nog in the Nog Kickstarter. Oh, isn't that I just that. Isn't that just fabulous? Yeah, I'm, I'm only getting four figures, but oh, they're just fantastic. I was so tempted to find, oh, I'll just buy them all, but no, I'm just going to get four, just to have nice little painting things. I did back the Gloom of Killforth Kickstarter as well. Did you? Oh, that, oh you kept quiet about that one. <laughs> Well, I, I did ask you about it. Yes, you did. Well, <laughs> you yes, you did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, it was exactly good. We kind of went, well, from what from what little we played of it so far, it seems interesting, and the artwork is gorgeous. Mm. Now, I watched quite a few videos, and uh, yeah, the mechanics of that look really cool it, as well. It is. It, no, it is. It is really, really cool, and especially with the new, with the where uh, the new expand uh, with the extra expansions they've done as far as, as part of the Kickstarter. Yeah, you know, with yeah. the extra, um, yeah, you know, with the extra character classes and races they brought in. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that is a lock- a fully fledged adventure game. That is uh, mm. that, that is really cool. I'd say fantastic artwork on that. Really, really nice. So, did you just back the for the original, or do, or, or have you gone for um, <laughs> the new version as well? That uh, you know the um, the expansion game that they're launching. Who are you talking to, Neil? <laughs> So you've pledged the extra 48 quid for the other one as well? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't decided that yet. <laughs> Although I seem to, I seem to remember, uh, when we did the, um, cause I, uh, cause I backed the, um, the 1066 game they did. And I didn't, ba- uh, um, I didn't pledge for the, 
uh, for the game mat, uh, which looking back is, is potentially a mistake, but there you go. And I was fully expecting that, that you could add it on in the pledge manager afterwards, and effectively you couldn't. <laughs> but I'm just hoping that maybe, just maybe, yes, I, I, I might get that, that extra expansion. Mm. Might just kind of well, fall it's, in. It's a separate game, so it's not out till 2019, I reckon. Yeah, this is it. It's uh, it's a case of they are going to be kickstarting it again next year, yeah. but uh, but basically they uh, they're already ahead of the game because yeah. effectively they ran out of ki- they ran out of stretch goals for Grim of Killforth because they basically produced absolutely everything they ever planned for it. And I kind of went, oh, in that case, then uh, let's start expanding this other game, which which is still kind of in development. But they will be kickstarting it again next year, but it's not going to be as cheap. No. Yeah, so I did that. Um... I have produced my pledge on the, the Joan of Arc Kickstarter as well, and, and I'm I'm not sure whether I'm going to drop it. I might just... I'm just looking to think, do I need another big game? And mm. I just I just don't know. You know, the mechanics look nice. You get a lot in there for, you know, for the basic pledge. But I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I might just drop that one. I'll see how I feel yeah. before it finishes. I can see where you're coming from. There's a heck of a lot in it. Uh, and mm. all the extra add-ons they put into it. I mean, the castle is just incredible. And, you know, in the same way as we did, uh, as they did from, for, you know, when they did Mythic Battles. I mean, there's, uh, it, it looks superb. But I, I kind of, I, I kind of know where you're coming from. It's like, yeah, because you, you, you do start to get to the point, kind yeah. of going, uh, dare we say, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Because <laughs> potentially you're dropping another. I mean, like, yeah, even if you're going for the gamer pledge, I mean, you're you're potentially dropping another, uh, you know, um, four hundred and fifty odd dollars, five hundred dollars on it. Yeah, uh, that's I, a I lot of you, money, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. leading um, of course to the follow-up question: When are you going to play it? That is the question. That is the big question. Is yeah, would I play it? I, I, I sort of look at the time I have to play, and I I, t- I tend to go and meet my my mate Mark once a week, and we play. Well, at the moment, we're playing Seven Continents, Lord of the Rings, Arkham Horror, little games like that. Mm. I have one or two big games a month with all the guys, but we tend to do a war game. We do meet up down Firestone quite a bit, and we'll play a board game there. But I'm just thinking, I don't know if I need it. I mean, I, it's lovely mechanics, it's great stuff, but. I, of course, you've got Mythic Battles coming. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. So I'm. I might. I might just drop that one. I'll see how I feel. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Um, I bought two deep cut mats. Thank you, Neil, for pointing me in the direction of a printer mat, or whatever it's called. Printo. <laughs> Printo matto. <laughs> I must admit, I mean, it's a brilliant service. Yeah. Uh, it's really clever. It's it's re- it's a really good service. But what is it? It's called Printo Mat. It's can I have extra cheese with that title, please? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, I got that. So I, I, I got the Lord of the Rings card game one, and that arrives, and it's gorgeous. Mm. So um, I've done a um, Arkham Horror one as well. Yeah, you found an Arkham Horror one, didn't you? Yeah, that's a lovely uh, illustration on it. Ooh, yeah, so, that uh, looks. Yeah, I'm thinking. Oh, I might have to get the book of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's obviously, of course, you find up getting Arkham Horror, which uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, if, if you buy the game, which you're going to buy next week. It's not twenty five thirty pound mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean Amazon do next day delivery. Anyway. And finally on the purchase purchasing. Mm-hmm. Are you both sitting down? Go on. I bought some stuff directly from Games Workshop. You're fired. Well, it's been lovely being on you. And I'll uh <laughs> I bought some Lord of the Rings stuff off them. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Was it the plastics? No, it's metal. It's all metal. It metals. Well, I I thought when it arrived, I thought oh, it's going to be that fine car stuff. No, oh. but it arrived. It's 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 metal. It's like popper. Wow. Yeah. So was this stuff that you just basically couldn't get any anywhere else? It's. Um, I needed a couple of extra Rohan Royal Guard mounted. Yeah. And on eBay, they're stupid amounts of money. Yes. On the game workshop site, they're not. <laughs> so I bought them. Um, I bought some um, some elf um, sentinels because they look like nice figures to paint. And they got some um, some half ogres, 
which um, I haven't seen before, but they're sort of big, orky sized stompy, stompy things. So I bought two of those. I thought they'd be quite good fun for, for trying out the rules because we can do big, very big creatures in groups of two. Mm. And I thought, oh, that'd be nice. So good experience then for buying from Game Workshop. It, it, it was very quick, very professional, <laughs> as you would expect. Mm, cool. And, and it's metal. Because so, yeah. I, I must admit, I've been looking at the Games Workshop site for some Lord of the Rings stuff. Uh, for some of the plastics, the stuff for the, again that is that is silly prices on eBay, uh, but actually decent price on, and especially with uh, you know the accident that I had when when Mister uh, with the box that uh, Mister Hyde sent me, <laughs> when I suddenly discovered that I now have two extra armies, or one and a half extra armies. <clears throat> I might be sending you some more stuff as well. Really? Uh, yeah. Um. I- Popped down and saw saw Jeff the Mr Bond. <laughs> Hi Jeff. <laughs> and um, I thought his box was empty. No, the, no, this is this is Jeff Bond. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh! Sorry, Papa Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Yes, yeah, Papa, Papa Jeff. Papa this Jeff. Is, this is Ham, Ham and Jam Jeff. Ham and Jam Jeff. Yes, Ham and Jam Jeff. Yeah. Early, well, he, uh, he got given um, some stuff from a friend of theirs. For, for their son moved out of uni and left his box of. Games of um, Lord of the Rings stuff. <clears throat> it's it's pretty beaten up, but there might be a few bits in there. I'm going to sort it out over the weekend. So yeah, he gave me that. And, uh, I tell you what, talking to Jeff, Mister Bond, I have been getting a tremendous amount of ribbing off him quietly in in the back. He's been whispering in my ear, saying bad things. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, when it comes to friendship, he is the epitome of Floxy Moxie in, in a pilificorium. Um, Floxy Percy Nihilification. Nih- 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 what? Sorry. Floxy Percy Nihilification. That's the one. The action of estimating something is worthless. Indeed. Who says this podcast isn't educational? <laughs> Indeed. Not it only is. do we teach you long words, we teach you how to pronounce French properly. Formidable. Yes. How did you learn that word? I'm sure you didn't come up with that yourself. Well, Floxy Noxy in the inner pillar <laughs> Yes. Especially, as you can see, however, he didn't learn it. Especially since you can't, you, you can't even pronounce it. <laughs> it's a perfectly no. Well, it's it comes from his Welsh roots. It's Welsh roots. So, so, okay, yeah. so so it, yeah, it, those 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 Welsh roots, which are Latin, you mean? Uh, yeah, by Latin Welsh, it, it all comes from the same same vein, Mike. You what? Know? So you just kind of just drop that into conversation every now and again, do you? Every now and again, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't I? Um, why Why would you, Mr. Hobbs? I refer the honourable gentleman to the fact that we've already got two minutes of conversation out of it. Uh, well, um, well um, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hobbs. I've been busted, haven't I? I think it's time for you to come clean. Well, you see, about ten weeks <laughs> Go ago, and stand in the naughty corner and tell me all about it. And while you're at it, take, take hello Jeff with you. <laughs> How do you know it was him? <laughs> Who else was it going to be? Yeah, Jeff challenged me about ten weeks ago to drop a word, a word of the day into the last few podcasts, and this was the last word. And I knew it was a step too far. Oh, well, just to... the fact that you could yeah. actually pronounce it. Yes. <laughs> right, Jeff. <laughs> if you're listening, whatever it was, you bet him. Since I can actually pronounce it and know what it means, I'll have it. <laughs> it was for the honour. The... <laughs> I'll take that and gladly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, over the last um, <laughs> ten weeks or so, I've been dropping words into the podcast, and this was the last one. This is the last one. We require the list. Hmm? I was thinking we could always then offer a prize to the listener who can give us the timestamps of all the words. <laughs> I was and the thinking, episodes I, they appear in. I was yeah. thinking. I was thinking that that exactly. Yes. Well, I, I do have to say that one of the words didn't appear in in the meeples and miniatures because I did drop it into Jay's podcast the other day when I was recording. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tell you what, I'm going to give you the ten words and see who's the first person to come up with the reason for these words. Okay. First one. So we start off with collateral. 
Uh, 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 oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Unscrupulous. Libertarianism. L- what? They're getting longer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Tantric. Oh, yeah. oh I, remember. <laughs> I remember the tantric <laughs> one. <Yes. Yeah. laughs> that was... Yeah, trying to drop that into a conversation about wargaming is tricky. <laughs> oh, I, I do remember thinking at that point, actually, going, what the heck's he on? <laughs> yeah. Tantric, what? Yeah, moving on. Um, omnivorous. Yes, I, yes, I, I, I Oh, oh, you feng shui, uh, right, oh, feng shui. yes, feng shui, oh, yes, I, rem- I remember where that came in, yes. Yeah. It's a, lot easier to, it's, a, it's a lot easier to spot them if you're focusing on every word when you're editing, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, sorry. Um, after that, we had Lagorius, uh, we had Ungolines, which is the one I dropped into, um, into Jay's podcast. And then two today, which were formidable, formidable. <laughs> and Foxy Noxy in the Pelivacorium. So, so, so what we're in fact saying is the easy way to spot the words that Hobbs has been bribed to drop in is that the ones he can't bloody well pronounce. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the list. See if you can work out why. Why? Yeah. Why is those particular words? Uh, Jeff, next time you want a little game, pick on somebody else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> right. Jeff, brilliant, mate. Well done. <laughs> oh, we have been stitched. Uh, well and truly. I did wonder why Feng Shui came up in the discussion about Derby, but there we go. <laughs> I, I really had to guide the conversation oh, no, some... to, to be fair <laughs> given, given the state of the rooms at Derby it wasn't far off no it wasn't you done very well to put some of those in mate <laughs> yeah I was very proud of uh, libertarianism and uh, Lugarius was uh, oh. right who's next <laughs> shall I go next yes please do right go okay <laughs> right okay painting I, I have started painting something uh, I haven't got very far with them at the moment, but I am uh, I am part way through painting my next warband for Test of Honor. So uh, that's the um, if you may remember uh, for the Warring States uh, campaign day, which uh, there's going to be another one in, uh, in February, uh, February or March next year. So uh, I'm I'm already going to sign up for that because that was tremendous amounts of fun. Uh, but yes, I am I am now painting a. Rebel Alliance inspired colour scheme faction for Test of Honor uh, with uh, some quite interesting unarmed samurai as my heroes. Uh, so I've been doing that. Uh, that's kind of just been slow going because I've just kind of like done a bit here, there, and everywhere sort of thing while in between everything else. Playing <sighs> so many games. Right, okay, so. Uh, had a couple of games of Dungeon Saga. Uh, defeated the door. Huzzah! Uh, <laughs> woohoo! <laughs> woohoo! Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, we, we had a couple of games of uh, Dungeon Saga because uh, Mr. Luff was finally well enough to play again after having something like a month off. So, as you for going to Malaga and coming back with them, um, coming back with the Lurgy. Had a game of Ninja All Stars, uh, which uh, I'm really enjoying. Uh, had a game of that with Josh. Played another game of Imperial Assault. Uh, again, another game I'm really enjoying. Uh, ooh, got scythed to the table last week. Now there's an interesting game. There's a really interesting game, isn't it? That is <laughs> seriously clever. Yeah. How long were you playing it before you actually worked out what you had to do? Oh, um, I cottoned on quite quickly, I must admit. Um... <laughs> And got to the point where I'd actually managed to play all my six stars. I mean, we, we only had a two-player game. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere near it. It's best with two players, but we were just doing a learning game. But I managed to play all six of my achievements before David managed one. Oh, that's good going. <laughs> yeah, because he was because yeah. he was kind of going. He was taking the broad brush approach. Uh, okay. He'd almost completed like four, but hadn't quite. 
And in the meantime, I just kind of gone, oh, I'll do some of that, and I'll do some of this, and I'll do some of that, I'll do some of this. And he's like, oh, hang on a minute. Ooh. Very, very clever game. Mm. Uh, looking, forward to, and- looking forward to playing that with, like, four players. That should be superb. Yeah. And a pretty game as well. <sighs> just the artwork's fantastic. Yeah. And the fact that things like, for example, even, like, all the meeples for each individual faction are all different. Mm. Okay, the model. Okay, the, yeah, the yeah, the plastic models for the mechs and for the heroes are different, but even the wooden meeples are different and stuff. It's just really ah, oh, it's no, it's really really nice game. I can imagine. I mean, it's quite interesting. We when we played it, both of us looked at each other and went, "Blooming it, look, you know, Luffy will take a dog's age playing this." Because every turn it'll be, okay, what's my best move? To be fair, that's, I mean, that's where he gets part of his enjoyment is kind of maximizing his, uh, you know, he's working out what his best move is as, as part of a game. I mean, it's certainly a game that he will love. Um, I'm just not looking forward to the four hours that, that it will take for him to play his turns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the game that we played. No, I was really impressed with it. Really, really impressed with it. It's a crack. It's a cracking game. That is, uh, as you say, and as you say, incredibly pretty. Mm. Really lovely looking game. And apparently, there are several expansions out for it. Who knew? There you go. Yeah, they got a five-player um, expansion, haven't they? I no, is it six? I, it's a six-player expansion, is it? Because it already six, plays five. Yeah. There's always a six-player then. Yeah. I don't know what else they've done. I, mean, I think there's a couple of uh, other kind of just like yeah promotional expansions out for it, but it's no, it's a very pretty game. Mm. Um, other and, and the other thing I did, and the other thing we did because we played this on Monday night, because you know it's, it was it was the night before Halloween, so we had to play Mansions of Madness. So we had another game of Mansions of Madness. Uh, Luffy played for the first time. Um, I'm not quite sure what he thought of it because the scenario we, we played is actually was actually based. Oh, on uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth. Do you remember the Shadow Over Innsmouth short story? Yeah. Yeah. So the scenario. Well, if you remember the short story in Shadows Over Innsmouth, the scenario starts at the point where you're in the hotel room and there's a knock on the door. <laughs> and at that point, it's like, uh, oh and Dave's, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and Dave's kind of okay. W- what do we have to do? And we kind of went. We don't know. All we know is we're in this. I mean, you know, other than the fact that there's four of us in this in this hotel room, so it's quite yeah, it's quite cosy. Uh, <laughs> and we know there's like okay, there's three places to explore, or we could open the door. And it's like, and it's like, what do we do? It's like we don't know. And no, but no, it basically followed a, a lot of the story of Shadows of Rinsmouth, and it was a superb scenario, really, really cool. Uh, we lost because. To, to be fair, I think I think three of us effectively went insane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's Cthulhu. You always lose Cthulhu. Even yeah, when you so win, you it's, lose. It's, it's a Cthulhu game. You expect to survive that with your sanity intact? No, no. Yeah. no. Uh, but it was, uh, and this is the. I said this is the one thing with whether you, whether I get Arkham Horror or not, because uh, I don't know how much of the same. Although, as I say. Arkham Horror is one of these things you can take anywhere, uh, and it's in and it's in a lot little box as opposed to ha- having to take an app and you know miniature games and everything with you. But Mansions of Madness is, I think, my favourite game of the year so far because simply of the the whole immersive storytelling element part of it. It's just done so well, mm. uh, and so that's my that's the only reason at the moment where I'm kind of going, do I buy Arkham Horror or not? I'll probably end up by getting Arkham Horror eventually, but uh, but no, we're we're seriously enjoying Mansions of Madness. It's a cracking mm-hmm. game. So we did that as as, as part of our um, uh, yeah for like um, Halloween buying buying. Oh, um, had a Kickstarter turn up, which I, I actually had that turn up a couple of weeks earlier, but I forgot to ta- I forgot to t- tell you about it on the last show. Uh, we had the uh, Burrows and Badgers Kickstarter turn up. Several figures for that. That was nice. Got some, got the, the mice, the rats, and the foxes, guys. They are gorgeous. They are absolutely gorgeous miniatures. Uh, 
And from the fair, uh, uh, yeah, they were, I'll probably almost be finished by the time you hear this show, but uh, they're running uh, Heroes and Sensible, sh- uh, Heroines and Sensible Shoes at the moment, uh, for a couple of weeks. But, uh, I just want, but no, the, um, Budgers and Bar- uh, sorry, Badgers and Burrows, which is great. So they turned up, uh, bought three expansion packs for, uh, Lord of the Rings, which completes the, Angmar Awakens cycle, uh, simply because it was bugging me because I only had the, I had the first three expa- yeah I had the first three expansion card decks for for the Angmar Awakens expansion uh, cycle, uh, but I didn't have four, five, and six, and it was bugging me. I'm I'm not saying anything, Neil. <laughs> it was <laughs> it got to the point it was really bugging me <laughs> the fact that I had half I had I had half, uh, basically a half set, <clears throat> uh, and then. I accidentally bought a board game on on eBay. <laughs> when you say accidentally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I what you 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 fell on the keyboard <laughs> <laughs> and entered a bid by mistake. It was close. Yeah. I mean, basically, it was as far as worker placement games are concerned. Uh, Pillars of the Earth is a really good game. One will have to play with you. Uh, but Pillars of the Earth is a really good game. Anyway, and the, uh, and you, you remember, you know, the Ken Follett novels, Pillars of the Earth and, and, um, oh, yeah. and then there's the, uh, oh, what's it called? Oh, it's called, man. It's, it's, what's the sequel called? Uh, begins with W. Yes. And uh, it's, it's a game I bought as well. And I'm, oh, God, what's it called? World Without End? World with, uh, in. World without yes. end. World without end. That was it. Okay, yeah. So world without end. And the and the imminent new one, a column of fire, which is the third one in that series. Yes, but they did a second game called World Without End, which again is a really good game. Now Luffy's got both of these, uh, and I've got Pillars of the Earth. And World Without, I, I think World Without End, it's getting towards the end of its print run, and I just happened to notice that somebody had a copy on eBay for not a lot. And it's one of those things where you kind of put a bid in, kind of going, oh, that'd be nice to have. So I'll just put a bid in f- f- for that. I won't win it, so I'll just put a bid in for that. But, you know, knowing the fact that you put a bid in, knowing the fact, for the full fact that you will not, you know, that, 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 that you will not win that bid because somebody's going to, you know, because the amount you bid, somebody's going to outbid you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As you do. It's nice when it, when that happens. <laughs> <and maybe. laughs> <laughs> and I won it. And it was like, oh, yeah. oh, okay, fine. <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I've uh, yeah, I bought World Without End uh, board game, and that is a that again. We we'll have to play that with you. That is a, that is a cracking game. Really, uh, really thematic, and uh, yeah, really good story. You bring it down here sometime. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, that 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 was a bit of an accident. Uh, other than that. Uh no, how, no. I think I managed to escape buying much else other than well, I've been buying bits and pieces. Yes, I tweeted over the week, over last weekend when I sat down. At, uh, when we were talking about Lord of the Rings. Uh, I sat down and worked out. Uh, I was thinking, oh, I really, I, I could really do with sleeping these cards, and then suddenly worked out and realised how many, how many I had. <laughs> I kind of went, oh, <laughs> I didn't quite realise I had that many cards. <clears throat> Ah, hey ho! So you bought seventeen expansions of Lord of the Rings, didn't you? Oh, oh, oh sorry, I was forgetting the other expansion I bought for Lord of the Rings, which was because <laughs> um, uh, Mountain of Fire, which is the last Saga expansion, came out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that basically completes. That means now you can play. Uh, uh, you can now play through the Hobbit and the whole of the fel- uh, and the whole of the, Lord, the Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and the Son of the King. Uh, nice, cool. Mm. Yeah. Are they open, yeah? <laughs> sorry. Take your knife out your back. I'm sorry. That was that was low of me. That was it was bad. very that was low. Bad. Yeah. Some of them are right. Yeah. How many Some... car sleeves have you bought? How many car sleeves have I bought? Um, I've got 2,000 on the way. <laughs> we, we should do half of them. Yeah. And then I need to sort out, sort out how the heck I'm going to store them all. <coughs> oh, obviously, <coughs> sell the ones you don't play. <laughs> 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 Mr. Whitaker. Um, what? What? 
what, 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 what manner of crazy talk is this? Well, s- sell a part of a collection. <laughs> deary, deary, me, man. Go yeah. wash your mouth out with soap. That, that's Josh's job at, um, at Neil's funeral. There'll be a big uh, car boot sale outside. I mean, obviously, we'll all be very sad, but I'm, I'm taking extra money. Well, well, saying, it's, it's, what, it's what he would have wanted. <laughs> <laughs> What's that smell of almonds? <laughs> I didn't think that had marzipan in it. (laughs) (laughs) Moving quickly on, Mr. Whittaker. (laughs) What have you been up to? Yes. What have I been up to? Well, played a few games. Had the latest round of the club's Game of Thrones um, campaign the day before yesterday. Um, Got slightly less hammered than I did last time, but still lost. Um, very fun little scenario in which I had to get a unit right across from one corner of the table to the other with a, with a messenger. So I, I assigned it to one of the faster moving foot units, uh, which also had Wall of Swords, uh, which turned out to be the last unit surviving. With the, was stuck with the interesting position. Well, I can stand here, and his cavalry will probably destroy themselves against the Wall of Swords, or I can move, and then his cavalry will probably maybe destroy me which was getting to be an interesting decision, except for the large unit of crossbowmen that started appearing over the horizon. Ah, what's that coming over the hill? Is that a unit of crossbowmen? Yes, it's a unit of crossbowmen, which was, was rather sad from that point of view. Um, also had a game with Star Wars Armada, won for the second time in two games, which is so unlike me as to be ridiculous. Woo! Admiral Akbar turns out to be a very handy character to have if you play the Rebels, because quite a few of the Rebels have quite heavy flank broadsides rather than front weaponry, unlike a Star Destroyer, which basically blows you to, blows, you to, blows the living daylights out of you with the, the spine-mounted railgun or whatever it is. Um, and Akbar gives you extra dice on your flank attacks if you don't do anything from the front rear. <coughs> so I popped off the first of Dave's first of Dave's ships from, from, from extreme long range, and the first turn he was most put out, and things went sort of downhill from there. What else? Played played my first game of Seventh Continent with Ash and Pippa from the club and Anne on Sunday. Saturday, yes. in fact. Yes. Which was effing awesome. I'm so glad you liked it. <laughs> well, I'm better. I've played for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so, we did one of, because Ash and Pippa are halfway through the starter scenario, we did one of the later ones, uh, which was a bit shorter. So we did actually finish it by dying horribly. Yeah, yeah that happens. Yeah, it's one of those. One of those. Clever, isn't it? Yeah, you get to the point where it's, and you now need to decide which card you wish to pull next. And we're looking at them going, we appear to have got this far without enough information to figure it out. Bother. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, absolutely fabulous game. So you're telling me I made a mistake in not pledging for it then? Uh, yes. Yeah, among the many things you've made a mistake in not pledging for. I mean, I, I would say it's for my formidable. <laughs> you would. Yeah. <laughs> and, you got, and you still can't say it right. <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, Repeat after me. For? For? Me. Me. Da. Da. Blur. Blur. There you go. For? For, for, me, me, da, ba, blah, 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 blah. Formidable. <laughs> formidable. Yeah. You know, just as, as you would say, well, for me, da. Isn't it? <laughs> For me, dad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, anyway, so other than that, a small back box has arrived from a certain Mzeni Norman. Oh, are those your land girls? They will be my land girls. Yes, they're very nice. Thank you, Annie. Um, they're very, very, very nice, in fact. But then they're Annie's figures. Why would they not be? Uh, what else? Um, and having had a. A rational eyes of the board game collection. If anybody wants to buy a full Kickstarter pledge for Blocks Blood Rage that's still in its shrink wrap, talk to me. Really? Can I have? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll chat after this. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Get, get, hey, hey, hey. you got it. Get, get get in line. Get in line. Uh, including the fifth player expansion and the sixth and the Wolfman plan. Yeah. Can I just have the Kickstarter exclusives? No. You sell the best to Neil. Not splitting. <laughs> Unless you can reach an agreement between you. Neil will go hard. Well, Neil will we'll, we'll go. Um, we'll, we'll work something out. <laughs> you might want to look at how much this goes for on eBay before you do. <laughs> yeah, good point. I don't remember how much? Remember, remember um, a certain 
other Kickstarter, unopened Kickstarter pledge. Yes. Yeah. Goes for about the same amount of money. Mm. Serious? Bloody hell. Seriously. Yeah, well, we'd be looking at meat rate, wouldn't we? <laughs> Even so. Um, point <laughs> being, it's, it's sat in its shrink wrap cost, for a year. Cost. <laughs> it's sat in its shrink wrap for a year and a half. It is never going to get played because it is like Kingdom of Death. Quite a way down the queue of things that of of games that I want to dedicate lots of time to. Certainly behind the Imperial Assault and Dungeons, I agree. It's very definitely going behind Seventh Continent, and I only have so many board gaming weekends in a year, so it's not it's 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 going to go to waste sitting here, and I can turn it into a reasonable amount of money. So why not? I get that. Yeah, there's someone on the board game group who still hasn't. Except who still hasn't acknowledged the fact that he, he's, he's the next person in line for a refusal, after which um, you can argue about it. <laughs> no, I, I, I've got the, the game and the, the expansions that are out. So I think, I think I'm think i really missing a few of the Kickstarter. How many was there? Was it the Wolfman? Um, there's the Wolfman, the, the um, Giant, the Troll. And there was, uh, a, there was another, another... The Wolf Clan. Yeah, the Wolf Clan. The Sixth Clan. Um, yeah. Have you got the fifth, uh, fifth player extras? As yeah. long as the fifth player set. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Basically, some of which was not anywhere other than the Kickstarter, and and they do appear to be going for silly money on eBay. So yeah. uh, I'd be stupid, given given the luck of it getting played in any manner worth worthy of the name, it would be. Uh, I'd be stupid not to move it on. I think. Mm. <sighs> I know you may sigh. <laughs> No, I'm sighing because I might have to. Uh, I'm up to say I'll move it on elsewhere because because uh, because with with my current shopping list. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, we'll chat later. <clears throat> anyway, right. um, so yeah, that's me. Cool. Right. Okay. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be chatting with Simon Miller, uh, who you may remember is the author of To the Strongest." The nation is vast. There are battlefields of old, great convention halls, and worlds of fantasy to explore. Who will guide us across this great geek nation? Since 2010, Geek Nation tours have been providing holidays for groups of like-minded people. Whatever your nature of geek, tabletop gaming, TV, film, comic books, sports, or science. Geek Nation Tours caters for you. Visit www.geeknationtours.com for more details. And join the great Geek Nation. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. We are very pleased to welcome back to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. It is um, author of To the Strongest Rules. Uh, it's Mr. Simon Miller. Hello, sir. Hello. Very nice to be here again. How are you? Who well? I'm. I'm extremely well. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's great to chat again. I, I think it's probably been about two years, or possibly even longer. Possibly something like that. It was. I just had a look back. It was episode one hundred and forty. That right. we talk, uh, the, 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 that we talked to you, uh, that we uh, we yes. chatted to you and talked about to the strongest, uh, yeah, 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 which is say a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe that was just that was just before you launched it, wasn't it? I, I think just I before the salute launch. Mm. Um, yeah, that would be just before the salute launch. And I don't know if it's two years or yeah, it's at least two years, isn't it? Seventh of March, twenty fifteen. Yeah, two years. Yes, two years. Yes. So how's it gone? Oh, it's gone extremely well. So when we talk, we would, I'd basically at that point, I'd um, publish the PDF, the original PDF version of it. And we were just coming up towards Salute where I was going to launch the paper 
uh, the print version of it, which in a rather nail chewing way arrived um, the day before salute, nearly giving me kittens. Um, I, I mean, I was uh, nothing like was, the last minute. Eh? <laughs> it was it was a bit just in time. So we launched there, and I sold quite a lot of copies at Salute. I've sold sold a lot of e copies of it actually as well. Um, I haven't. I should have done a quick count up, but last time I looked at it, we were I was well north of two thousand copies sold, um, including the the PDF copies. Um, probably getting on for about two and a half thousand so oh, cool. it's quite a popular mm. quite a popular set of rules uh, i mean they're selling worldwide as well um obviously the uk is the biggest market probably accounts for about half of them but um lots sold to the us quite a lot of um players in northern france a very uh, very determined group in belgium belgium i know that there's a there are some Russians are probably not listening to this, but they're in uh, Ekaterinburg who are playing it. China won, I think. Uh, it's sold pretty well around the world. A lot of Australians and New Zealanders, um, as well as you'd imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, since then, I've kept up producing the lists and refining the lists. So we're up to, um, I think, just over 170 army lists now. We're starting to get from the... the um, the, the list you'd expect towards the more obscure lists. I've had a little bit of a rampage around Southern Asia recently, looking at uh, Tibetans and um, Vietnamese and Cham, which has been quite interesting. Uh, um, and I, I usually work with other people on those, so I'll find someone that knows a bit about that area and then we're kind of liaise and they give me their knowledge and I make sure the list is <coughs> proportionate to the other lists. Hmm. Um, 170. Yeah, 170. Um, <laughs> Just the one or two. Yes. <laughs> there's about eight booklets of them now, covering from uh, sort of well, pre-biblical, well, you know, the, the, the dawn of civilization through to what's the last list. It must be, the, I think, it might be the later Burgundians. Uh, at the moment, they go up to about 1500 or a little later than that. I am looking, um, one of the things we can touch on a little bit later um, is I'm looking to extend the rules further through until really the sort of the end of the Renaissance, the start of the sort of uh, the wars in um, the Netherlands. So um, more Arquebusiers, Landschnecht and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, To come, Italian wars, Italian wars, essentially. Yeah. Uh, Colonias and whatnot. (laughs) <laughs> that will so, so that covers a, then that covers a huge period. I mean, uh, yeah, a, a, an awful lot, of, an awful lot of companies. When it comes down to you know, when it starts to come into the Renaissance period, they think, okay, right, we'll uh, you know we'll produce a different set of rules to cover that particular period. So yeah, um, well, yeah, I suppose we we could talk about that now. So essentially, I'm I'm committed with 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 the uh, English Civil War version we're going to talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, That's going to take me until at least the middle of next year to get published. Um, After that, I'm I'm planning to have a, to do a revision of To the Strongest. And my current idea is to actually split it into three, probably three separate books. Um, um, An early book covering ancients probably through until um, the fall of the Roman Empire or thereabouts, mm-hmm. um, a sort of a medieval book or late antiquity and medieval book going on from there, um, and eventually a Renaissance book. And by splitting it into three, I, my intention is that I can put the more period-specific rules um, into chariots. There aren't, well, there'll only be chariots in the Ancients book because um, you don't need them in the other periods and Similarly, you don't need um, rules for handguns and arquebuses um, in the Ancients book either. Hmm. Um, so the intention is that um, I can keep the core mechanics the same across all three three books, but have the period-specific rules um, in each of the books. And while that will enable me to keep the books relatively slim um, and have each of them... Um, illustrated with period pictures 
um, period army lists and um, generally make them t the illustrations and whatever tie in with the rules and make them more specifically ancient and more specifically medieval uh, and a new renaissance book or a largely new renaissance book uh, where I want to cover the Italian wars partly because I want to have an Italian wars collection which I don't yet have <laughs> what inspired that then <laughs> yeah. um well um as you as you write the army lists you start to find out a little bit about the the periods and i got hold of um uh, a book uh, an osprey campaign book um called pavia by um angus constam mm. um up in edinburgh um which i i took on holiday reading with me and i just thought it's fantastic and the the bulk of them mechanics for for that period can very easily be accommodated within to the strongest even as it stands without the additional the additional rules um i just thought it would be a really really it would be a really good addition to the rules um to, to actually cover that i mean it's so such a colorful period uh, it's just got to be done uh, and you know there, i think there comes a point where the, the rules would stop working and I, I think the rules really stop working when muskets start to become really efficient yeah. and kind of a, an armor ceases to be of any particular value because muskets are, are, are efficient you know or armor is abandoned so you know then you're talking about the italian wars really so that's my intention anyhow there'll, there'll be eventually the three books and that means i can go on another 50 60 70 years then after that there will be probably be a gap in the time period covered by the rules at least for now um until you get to the english civil war the english civil wars we've very nearly uh, we've very nearly finished um at some point i hope to expand forward and backwards from those to cover the um 30 years war or 80 years war whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. uh, before and um go on until the um late um 17th century possibly at some stage the war of the spanish succession uh, i know that andrew brentle who i've been working on the uh, english civil wars rules with has got a very substantial war of the spanish succession uh, army which I, I i can only believe we will be using at some stage <laughs> <laughs> it's got it's got to happen it's a really interesting period I, i've been chatting a lot about it and, and reading about it um trying to give himself a little bit of a grounding in the the tactics and the the changes in tactics from between the english civil war and uh, marlborough uh, it, it, it it's really fascinating um to try and find out about it because it's all new for me really i'm i'm essentially an ancient buff that sort of wandered into medieval as tripped on a little further into renaissance hopped into the english civil war I and mean, god where will it end <laughs> <laughs> Actually, probably Napoleonics is where it will end, <laughs> but that will be a few years off. Yes, it would be quite interesting doing the um, War of Spanish Succession because they, they also had a sort of checkbox sort of formation, didn't they, where, where they'd have one regiment at the front and then one just behind. So it's quite Romanesque in, in their style. It is. Fighting. Uh, that's exactly what has always struck me about it. I, I remember back, right when I was back starting... Um, to the strongest i remember going around to a friend's house where they were playing a war of the spanish successions game and i thought golly that 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 could work pretty much the same way mm. i mean there's more of an obviously much more of an emphasis on firepower yeah um but essentially yeah you've got one line supporting another line you've got commands which are called brigades um you've got infantry you've got cavalry you've got the guns which you don't really have in ancients but um they can easily be be accommodated it's just a matter of it's it's a matter really of just deciding on the scale of the uh, of the thing you know whether um you're having a battalion as the maneuver unit we were having a chat about this only last weekend uh, um after having been uh, at the war games holiday center we had a we've been playing ancients all day and chatting about in the evening we were chatting about how you would to how would you how would you what scale you'd run a war of the spanish succession game at because the armies the main difference is really the armies were just so so much bigger it's huge yeah. armies compared to the english civil war vastly vastly larger there's another difference actually which 
which I, I've been thinking about for some time is the um, it was cropping up in a forum I was chatting on today um, in in the ancient period the two armies always almost invariably line up parallel with each other um, at the start of a battle um, whereas when you get to the and that continues really right the way through English Civil War most of the battles the two armies line up parallel to each other with the cavalry on the wings when you get to the war of the Spanish succession though armies are at uh, angles of like 30 degrees to each other and 60 degree angles and there are refused wings and um, um, sometimes cavalry are in the middle it, it's a little bit different and um, I, I do I wonder whether it might suit well it would either suit a square grid with units able to be positioned on a diagonal within a square grid or it might suit a hex grid uh, I'm keeping an open mind on that it'll be interesting I mean the, I mean to me, I think because they're using that sort of checker box style, you almost sort of want to lay your grid over that, don't you? And sort of say each regiment sitting into one square, so you, you do move it up a level. So, you know, you've got you know 500, 800 men per, per regiment, shall we say? Maybe that yeah. your your what goes into a square instead of trying to keep instead of trying to stretch it over a number of squares, shall we say? Yes. Um... And that we have been having a lot of debates about that. Um, it's a very con the frontage of a battalion is a very controversial subject um, for the War of the Spanish Succession, um, with a, a lot of people thinking that a B British battalion maybe had double the frontage of a French battalion at times. Certainly, if you look at a lot of the diagrams for the battles, you see that that's the case. And I'm still doing some researching into that. I'm not absolutely convinced that it was. I, I have a lot more books to read, um, I yeah. think, before I do it, before I, I, I'm inclined to think that the frontages of the battalions were a lot closer than um, we often think. Mm. Hope so, um, just just as a rules mechanic, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> certainly, certainly for a grid-based game, it, yeah. uh, I, I have a, um, I have a dog in that particular fight, I suppose you, you could say, in that the, the um, um, it's much more convenient for a grid based game. I did think about having a, a game where you could have a British battalion occupying three squares and a French battalion might occupy two. Um, but that's pretty fiddly. Um, and I think it, it, it um, it's very much easier if you have one battalion occupying a square or a hex or whatever, whatever it is that you're talking about. Yeah, because you, you could just include the sort of zone of control, couldn't you? And sort of say, even though the battalion's smaller, there's zone of control would cover this area and just sort of, uh, sort of fudge it that way, shall we say? Yeah, you could. You could. It's interesting. It's very hard to actually um, to actually find out what the frontage of a battalion at various times was. There, there seemed to be a certain certainty about this going back about 20 years ago, but everything I'm reading recently seems to suggest that um, it's very uncertain indeed um, and no one particularly knows there's a there'll be a cracking research project for somebody to actually try and pin down the battalion frontages by nation over a hundred year pe well 50 year period from the uh, mid 17th century through to the early 18th oh, yeah, mid 17th through to the early 18th yeah I mean it would be a great research project and actually just try and try and actually work out how how, how what sort of footprint the battalions had because i don't think it i think people think they know and i'm not sure that they're right at the moment we'll see though yeah. controversial controversial i'm not making any big claims but um I, I certainly i'm doing a lot of reading around it trying to work out what, what i'm trying to make sense of it to myself mm. I, I did listen to um another podcast and they were talking about a battle i think it was spanish um succession and they were talking about the way that the morale of units was certainly different because they each unit had their own flags, which was their sort of rally point. If the flag went down, then the the units uh, um, which were sort of um, attached to that leader would just run off to the next nearest leader who's, who's got a flag and basically. If flag All right. Went down, and right. then, as that flag went down, they then go off to the next flag that they knew was a friend and go and fight another until all the flags are gone, and then they. Then, <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I've not come across that one. I, uh, there's a lot of, seem to be a lot of um, people looking at how firefights were conducted and platoon firing and 
differences between firing between the the British and the Dutch and the Danes and the French. Um, indeed, different weapons, uh, cartridges. Cartridges apparently made a big increase to the rate of fire. Not something I'd thought about until until I read a book recently. Um, there was a lot of technological change going on in that period. This book I was reading recently suggested that um, between the end of the English Civil War and the um, early war of the Spanish succession, just after they'd abandoned pikes, um, the, the rates of fire that a battalion could put out roughly doubled over that um, 50, 60 years um, through sort of new technology and um, improved training. Uh, really, really interesting. That would make quite a difference on the battlefield. I mean, you know, instead of playing one card hitting on an eight plus, I guess you'd be playing two. <laughs> uh, it would need to be, need to, you'd need to find a way of factoring it into the rules that firepower had changed. And they, they, because they were, they were shooting so much, there was less, in, there was less, um, uh, units were a bit more reluctant to actually charge because if they charged, even if they were successful, they became disordered um, and vulnerable to whatever was in the second line or enemy cavalry. Anyhow, lots more reading to do on that one. It's fascinating learning about new periods, I must say. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely love doing it. Take a book out for a couple of hours and just try and get your head around it. Indeed, yeah. So we've kind of jumped ahead. Uh, <laughs> just, 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 just a couple of thousand years. Yes, just, yes, just a little bit. Yes, uh, bringing us back to the present. Then, so we, obviously, yeah. we've seen you around the shows uh, a lot over the last couple of years with, uh, yeah. with various size games are to the strongest, including you. Yes, been... usually, usually too big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yes, yes uh, sometimes accompanying Doctor Harry Sidebottom um, on, yes. on, on a couple of yes. occasions. Harry. Yeah, 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 lovely guy. Okay. Mm. Partisan, yes, um, that's always a good show. Very, very, uh, very friendly. And um, Harrywood, of course. I didn't make this. Couldn't make this year, unfortunately. But I've enjoyed the previous two, and I'm sure I'll be back next year. Um, and salute and Selwig, um, and occasionally, okay, I'm trying to think. That's most of the ones I do. Oh, I went to Colours recently as well. That was good. Mm. So I love taking a game to a show. It's it's really good fun. We usually manage to play twice during the day quite nice to see we usually get a few kids playing as well as the as well as the adults and uh that's quite rewarding as well i like to see i like to think that some of the there is a next generation coming along even if often it does seem to be us 50 60 somethings uh playing <clears throat> so yeah i go to I, I do like to go to the shows and it's a good chance to meet up with friends and see what other people are doing with games and I try and rotate the game, so Pikes and Romans, and I'm very pleased. I, I, I was very, um, very much enjoyed taking a Numidian army along to Selwig, which is something I've been working on on and off over like four or five years. And I finally managed to get the army just about as near as to finished, I think, as I would Oh, yes, I, yeah, I think I saw arms. that on your blog, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're just hordes and hordes of these uh, light infantry and light cavalry. Uh, there's there's no heavy infantry in the army at all. Um, it, it covers a lot of <laughs> a lot of ground, and and looks looks good. I'm really pleased with it. And it's an unusual army. It's not one you see very often. Hmm. Um, and it actually fights quite well. It's surprising, but it's uh, you wouldn't th you know you wouldn't actually think it would actually do very much. But uh, the the advantage of the light troops is that they are very manoeuvrable, and if they can find a flank or a hole in the line. Um, you can inflict some real damage um, with them. So I enjoy very much playing with them. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's been uh, there's been we're always saying there has been three world championships now. Hasn't there? Yes, we've had the um, uh, we've had the three world championships all um, at Chalgrove in Oxfordshire. The first one was quite a small affair. I think there were twelve or fourteen of us uh, played on that day. That was. The, I think that was before the hard copy of the rules had actually been um, issued. For the second year, we had 20-something, and last year we had about 30 players. Mm -hmm. And we've got the next one is on February the 24th um, in uh, Chalgrove near Oxford, um, and we expect to have uh, 50 players 
Thank you very well. We've got, I know we've got about 40 people signed up at the moment. So if anyone's thinking they might like to come along, then they're welcome to drop me a line uh, um, or um, drop Steve Dover a line if they have his contact details. Um, uh, Steve Dover is with the South Oxfordshire Generals who, who actually run the event. Um, I'm mainly publicise it and check the army lists and uh, and come along and play and lose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I managed to lose my the only game I managed to get in at the the last event. Um, but that's a really really good fun day. Um, it's an excellent. It's an ex- it, is, it is an excellent day. You were kind enough to lend me yeah. Uh, uh, to, yeah, to lend me an army for for, for year two, and uh, yes. Uh, and uh, f- f- uh, and people uh, might might remember or uh, or remind me very often of uh, this uh, this set of Norman cavalry that I have floating around. Uh, they were actually originally intended as as part of my army for uh, last year. Uh, well, sorry, yeah. this year you 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 just gone. Yeah. Uh, except for the fact that um, I, I then discovered that unfortunately for st- I forgot what I double booked with, but I ended up double booking with something, which is a bit unfortunate. Oh, I think it was what uh, I think it was the same day as Robin or something like that. But um, but anyway, oh, you're right. uh, it was it, it was uh, there was something something cropped yes. up at the last minute, and yeah. uh, and it was uh, all of a sudden it was like oh um, I've got uh, yes I uh, I had to cancel, which is a bit which is a bit of a shame. Uh, so. You never know. It would know. be fantastic I, to see you there again. And if you can't get your Normans finished, yeah, um, I, I might get see. me Normans. Like, yeah, 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 I'm, I, yeah. I might have to pull my finger out and actually see if I can finally paint these Norman cavalry. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, uh, Mike. Do you want to take this one or shall I? Far away. Okay. Really, your Normans, Neil. <laughs> 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 That's why I originally put them. To- I originally put them together because I wanted to do my. Uh, uh, yeah, I wanted. I wanted to, to do a Norman army for the eternity. Yeah. Long- so yeah, that would be. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what happens yeah. on that one. <laughs> Four years well, ago, wasn't see it? if you can get them done, or drop me a line, and um, I'd be very happy to to lend you some. Uh, I'm. I have been um... just bring them along, Sam. Just bring them along. <laughs> <laughs> well let's face it Simon you had you do have the the odd army lying around that that the <laughs> yeah 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 I've got a few figures um I don't have that many armies but they are quite large um so <laughs> I'm sure I could lend you a I'm sure I could, I could probably lend you some Romans or a, or a phalanx or something like that I, I've been vacillating I quite fancy taking a a, a hoplite army with me um I have a theory for uh, um, some tactics um, I could use with those that might be entertaining. Um, uh, or um, I, I've been also been working slowly on a um, Italian condottieri army um, for for myself, which I picked up some figures at, um, on a on a whim, and uh, they're lovely figures, you know, with turbans and um, lots of crossbowmen and some very glitzy knights and uh, even a small artillery piece it's uh, it'd be a fun fun army to do so uh, if i have time to get them done my trouble is i have a lot of basing to do because i'm putting on the uh, i booked a big table for um salutes for the english civil war rules launch um and i have about a thousand figures to base before salute um now i i'm quite slow at basing figures because i do spend quite a lot of time on it um, so I'm going to have to work out how I'm going to how I'm going to get cover all that ground. Uh, I may not have time to do my condottieri as well. So it takes precedence anyhow. Yes, and that's for my um that 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 leads on I suppose to the um uh, yes yeah, sorry look, just recapping on that if anyone wants to enter into the world um that's on the 24th of February um um we're playing four games this year instead of three during the course of the day because everyone's got faster now they know now they know the rules um the um um you just need a 28 mil army um if you don't have a 28 mil army i may be able to lend you a 28 mil army as long as you like romans or pikes uh, or numidians <laughs> then, then you're okay and um we play a we have, it's a fun day it's not very competitive um most of us uh hang around the middle of the rankings. There's a lot of competition for the Wooden Spoon Prize. It's fiercely fought over. Uh, and uh, we have got now, a, I think this will be the third year that we've had a contingent come over from uh, Belgium for it. I know we've got, uh, obviously we've got some Welsh people coming. 
Uh, and we may have some Scots this year. I've um, I've thrown a gauntlet uh, northwards, but we'll see we'll see whether they uh, sign up for it or not. That's cool. a great day. Oh, and this year I'm planning to go and stay in the area, um, stay in a local hotel the night before, um, and probably get a bunch of people together and um, have some beers and a curry. So a little pre-competition preparation. That's, that's a, that sounds like a tremendously good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a lot of people. If people are coming, people are coming a long way, you know, from Belgium. They might as well uh, maximise the enjoyment of the event with some traditional English beer and traditional English curry. So, uh, yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Excellent stuff. Mm. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, we've hinted at it, and and, and you and you have mentioned that. Uh, uh, it's going to be your major, your first major project for uh, for next year, and actually, yeah. it's, it's one of the reasons why uh, we, we got to speak to you again. Because uh, contrary to popular opinion, with the fact that at, at some point you did tell us you were you're going to be working on a fantasy set of rules, you've gone off, you, you've gone off and done something diff- uh, 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 different hmm. in 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 a different historical period. Yeah, so I mean, I think. Um... When we spoke uh, about 18 months back, I was working more or less in parallel on an expansion to cover the Italian wars um, and a set of fantasy rules. And of course, now what I've actually come up with is a set of rules for the English Civil War, which is (laughs) something of a miss. I possibly missed my target there. Um, The reason for this was that um, I had the the, particularly the fantasy rules. Um, I I did a lot of kicking around um, and came up with quite a lot of ideas and ways that would be similar to to the strongest and ways where it might be might be different but it's quite a, it's quite difficult writing a really generic set of fantasy rules if only you knew um, somebody that uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that was that was that was currently involved in that sort of project <laughs> um, who's that I'll, I'll just say quiet <laughs> All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So, sorry. Um, I looked at. I can well, after, writing... after all, why break the habit of the last two months? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I looked at it, and I, um, I got a little bit of along the way, along the way with it, and then one day, uh, my friend Andrew Brentnell um, dropped me a line and um, uh, said, "I've actually been messing around with your rules, and I've come up with an English Civil War version." And I thought, oh sounds interesting then he sent me a picture of some some of his lovely 10 millimeter collection all lined up in boxes ready for a, a fighter scenario um i thought oh, well i'll go up there for a day and have a game of it and we had a very enjoyable game um and then i thought i quite but well, the nice thing about it was that it, it the english civil war or the, or the british civil wars if you want to look at them they cover a pretty short period of time there aren't a vast number of troop types, um, and they're they're very dear to us. I think they're very. They're, it's a very interesting period that hasn't been. I wouldn't say it's it's not one of the primary periods that's been gamed recently. Mm. And I just thought this would be a fun short project. Um, I can knock this set of rules out really quickly um, and get them published, and then I'll go back and look at fantasy. Well. I think we've been working on them now for about 18 months and I've come to the conclusion I don't do anything terribly quickly. I like to think I do things quite well, but not terribly quickly. Uh, and we have got a cracking set of English Civil War rules that will be coming out uh, at Salute. They're called um, For King and Parliament, mm-hmm. um, and, which is at first sight, it's a slightly contradictory title, but... In the English Civil War, on the on the corners, the the you know the flanks of the cavalry regiments, and they quite often had for King and Parliament, or for God, King and Parliament, or for for God and Parliament. But the most of the parliamentary uh, regiments, at least until well into the war, claimed to be fighting to save the king from his evil advisers. Um, they were loyal subjects. Um, of the king, obviously, even though they were fighting him. Um, so, for king of parliament, seemed quite a quite a quite a apt title um, for the rules, and they're quite similar to to the strongest um, in some ways. Although we've there's a lot more shooting. I mean, you know, almost every unit um, has a, a ranged 
capacity either from its muskets or its pistols um, or because it's artillery so that's different to the to, to the strongest where only a proportion of the units tend to have it uh, we also had to introduce particular rules that are relevant to the English Civil War like um, uh, cavalry pursuit you know obviously it's a big thing cavalry tended to defeat their opponents and ride off the battlefield while the battle was lost somewhere behind them mm. uh, and uh, we've got some interesting new mechanics in it as well so what have we got what, what we've done that's particularly new one of the things we've come up with is called dash um cavalry regiments tend to start off with three dash markers which means they have three good charges in them dash is a measure of the fitness of the horse and the enthusiasm and training of the rider and after they've done their three charges with dash um they're not they're, they're the horses are blown um they're not fit for very much anymore and of course if they go pursuing um out of control pursuing that also loses them dash so cavalry um, i think has often tended to happen are they 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 are sort of expended during the battle and it's not unusual to see um both wings of the battle which start off with two lines of cavalry facing each other reduced to a few scattered units charging in random directions um, um by the end of the game so that's quite interesting we also managed to get a really good uh, command and control system together um so um we've got brigades rather than commands but a brigade fulfills much of the function of a command in um into the strongest um yeah. what other rules would be a lot of the other so as we've gone on along where there's been a quite a good mechanic sometimes i've actually pushed those rewritten those and introduced them in into um to the strongest via the supplement the even stronger supplement um, oh, okay. that i have to the strongest mm -hmm. which is a downloadable online um supplement it's free uh, um, and it has about five sides in A4 of um, additional rules um, that are optional, except in competitions where we tend to play them all. Yeah. Um, but uh, some of the, 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 it's thrown up some really interesting ideas. Uh, we also, we've also managed to do um, activations. I think I've managed to express that, or Andrew and I have managed to express that slightly more clearly um, in uh, for King and Parliament. So um, at the moment, I'm furiously raising... Uh, regiments for the salute game i'm also going, going to do a little uh, photo shoot in um, nottingham with uh, war games illustrated uh in december as well so i'll have enough figures by then to put on put on a, a goodly a high quality small game um, yeah for them uh, and so, I love the modeling aspect of it that's just absolutely terrific uh, i mean all this time i've been doing romans no, they don't have any flags worth speaking of. I mean, you know, there's like sometimes the Roman army of the, the early ones might have had one flag, which is like a red cloak outside Caesar's tent. You yeah. Know, in this, everyone can have a flag. You know, the, the the regiments of foot have ten flags or twelve flags. The the each troop of horse has a flag or two. It's marvelous, um, and the flags are so big and so beautiful. It really is. I. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm glutting on the flags at the moment. <laughs> They're stunning. Uh, I mean, the flags, the the king's lifeguard afoot, the flags for that regiment are just incredible. Um, the more pedestrian flags for the other regiments are really bright. And you know, I'm putting up three flags, three three flags to each regiment afoot, and each regiment of horse as well. Actually, has three small three small coronets. Oh, it's really great. I'm, you know, it's from famine to feast. Yeah. For flags it is. Uh, so for this uh, for this particular game, I, 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 again, are, are you doing it in twenty eight mil? Yeah, my personal stuff is um, in twenty eight mil. Yeah. Um, so Andrew's collection is sort of ten mil stroke twelve mil minifigs and um, pentagon, I think. Um, mm -hmm. um, lovely, lovely minis. I'm of course doing it in twenty eight because all my stuff is in twenty eight. I think most people. I would imagine most people will play the game if they're using 28 mil figures with a battalion that will be about 18 centimeters wide. Uh, I would imagine that would be the normal way that people will approach it. Um, because my all my gaming really is aimed at shows, I'm going to go about 30 centimeters wide for a battalion, 25 to 30 centimeters. 
because when you're doing something at a show, you need really big units to for, to stand out. Yeah. Um, and I like to see really big units. I mean, I've always loved to. See, I've always loved having pretty large units. So I've, I'm going for battalions of forty, uh, about forty-two foot, and um, regiments of horse of about eighteen for the um, what people often call chargers, and twenty-seven for what people often call trotters. Mm. Um, we're calling them um, Swedish and Dutch, respectively from the tact the names for the tactical formation that the troops adopted yes and that's quite an interesting thing to get your head around the the, the different cavalry tactics um that were um that were practiced during the war um with us at the start of the war the parliamentarians started off in these deeper formations that tended to stand to receive a charge or at least advance very slowly um whereas the royalists tended to do a charge at not necessarily a gallop but a good round trot and uh close right into the enemy and, and be right in amongst their formations before they fired their pistols giving them more of a shock effect um which is copied from the um um the sort of swedish system on the continent um but by the end of the war both sides were fighting exactly the same as far as we can determine there was a changeover about halfway through the war and everyone adopted more or less the same tactics yeah. yeah, that's yeah. it's quite an interesting thing to see on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. So, from a a mechanics and like a uh, I suppose from a from a game board point of view, are you still going with uh, the um, eight by twelve squares for the battlefield? Yes. Um, uh, well, usually people buy a usually people play on a six by four cloth with a fifteen centimeter grid um, for. Most people, that's how what most people play um, to the strongest on. Um, and um, that would be a sensible grid to play um, for King of Parliament on. Although I'm also, um, I've also just, funnily enough, I just received yesterday um, a load of rather larger um, eight foot by six foot cloths, which are really beautiful. They have a cross grid on them. Instead of having a um, the normal grid with the black lines, solid black lines, um, they just have a cross at the corner of the squares, so they're very subtle. You can see them if you know what you're looking for, but not they don't intrude on the eye. Yes. Um, and um, those would probably be very, very useful as well for it. I mean, it takes, ideally, really, you want a, you want a, um, a 12 foot by, sorry, a 12 square by 8 square um, table to play on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, we've got a scenario, uh, Battle of Montgomery, 60, 40, 1644, that I've played very many times that plays on on that sized uh, um, area. And we usually manage to finish a game in about an hour, hour and a half tops if it's a really, really close game Yeah. Um, um, on that. Um, a lot of people, um, it is, of course, scale independent. Um, Andrew's got... Um, um, actually, I haven't put any pictures on my, my blog, but um, last Friday night, I played um, a game with um, a co-author, Andrew Brentnell, in the um, Holiday Holiday Lodge in Basingstoke, uh, in the bar area. And we had a, we had, he's got this lovely uh, six millimetre collection, and we played on a three by two cloth um, with these beautiful six mil figures, a scenario that he's devised uh, called Lessie's Moor. Uh, and it was a really, it was a really good evenings, really good evenings play. We played to, uh, we played to finish in about an hour and a half um, with a couple of beers. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, on the same subject, um, um, a, another friend of mine, um, Ian Notter, has been developing um, a card set um, that you can play with on a three foot by four foot cloth, so that even people that don't have an English Civil War army. Um, should be able to play the King and Parliament, at least while they're getting their army together. Um, they can just play with these card, be- really pretty card units on a three foot by four foot cloth. That's now that's a really interesting idea because I've because uh, we've seen that with things like, like I mean, for example, we've seen that more recently with things like Blucher and uh, and uh, and yes so it become because we have kind of discussed in the past this the thought that to the strongest um 
it, although you know it's 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 a game with miniatures in some ways it it's almost a board game ish yeah, yeah i know it, it's funny I, I don't i don't tend to think of it that way but i suppose because i always play it with hundreds and hundreds of figures yes preferably thousands and thousands of figures but yeah it is a game that would be more because there aren't any angles i mean it because it's played on a square grid um it would convert quite well into um um into a board game or or even a computer game actually i mean it would be most games a lot of games really struggle to be played on a would be a lot of rules would struggle to convert to computer play but i think to the strongest would actually do that really well so if anyone wants to talk to me about licensing for a computer version just drop me a line <laughs> we, could, we could do it but i don't know to me i i, I think of it as a figure game yeah um, I don't know if that makes it a figure game or a board game. Well, I mean, I mean, I just thought I find it interesting with the, uh, you know, because it, 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 I suppose it almost fits in with the Command and Colors yeah. uh, family yes. of style, yes. style yeah. of game, which, 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 which to a certain extent can be played either way. But no, I just thought it was really interesting with the fact that you, you know, talk about this this development of card armies. Um, yes. Yeah, that you can use. That no, that is uh, it's really interesting, and say so it, it does mean that it makes the game very fast and accessible. Because while you're putting together whatever your you know, whatever collection it is, you yeah, you know, it's still a case of you can play the game in the meantime using these cards, which is which are, uh, is, is a tremendous idea. Absolutely, and I think um, one one thing I'm toying with, and I can't commit to it at the moment, is um, including. I'm likely to do uh, probably some sort of pack for the uh, pre-orders for um, Salute because it will definitely come out either well it will come out either at Salute or sometime shortly before Salute. And um, I've been thinking about putting in the cards for the units in the um, in the scenario that's actually included in the rulebook. Um, so that way people could actually play the battle that's in the rulebook on the day they buy the rulebook. And you know, learn to play the rules on that scenario, which is kind of how I've, which is kind of how we developed it, really, by playing that scenario very many times. So people can get off to a really quick start with it, and it's a bit of extra value. And um, I think the plan is we're probably, and I've I've got to go to a printer's and see if I can sort this. We'll probably laminate the cards so that people can write on them with a, a flip chart, not flip chart pen, um, um, a dry dry white pen, you know, ticking off casualties to the unit um, yeah. on that yeah. and um i i think um i need to chat with my friend Ian, <laughs> who's developed the cards but assuming that he's okay with that then we may well be able to go on and do some um, um later releases with some historical scenarios also on the cards uh, as well as using the cards in that way you could actually just put if you've got a 28 mil unit you can actually put the card behind the unit and use it for recording casualties during a figure game you know but just by ticking off the the uh, ticking off the boxes on the unit yeah. card although i'll be uh, like with to the strongest well i'll be selling chits that you can use uh, i've had some very nice uh, very attractive chits designed um for it uh, and i'll probably use i don't know I'll probably use chits i guess uh, behind the units and some we've got some, some you know we use um in to the strongest we use the victory coins to track who's winning and who's losing because yes. they give a very good visual visual guide to who's winning and who's losing the battle uh, you know as how many coins there are left on the baseline um there are some beautiful english civil war coins um, um that i've managed to source i've got newark siege tokens for the royalists and um tower sixpences no, no tower half crowns for the uh, for parliament Wow, um, which are around beautiful, beautiful coins. Um, so we'll be using those for the 28 mil games and possibly for smaller games as well. Um, so it's all coming on very well. We've had a quite a long lead up to it. I mean, it's been we've had it with various groups of play testers for a year and we've worked through some of the mechanics and um, changed things a little bit along the way. Um, now we're just going through working our way remorselessly through the text looking for. Uh, inconsistencies and spelling mistakes whilst we had the examples and do the, the final finishing so I need to get it written I need to finish the writing by Christmas so that um, I can concentrate on um, getting it printed in um, January and February for March but of course 
um, as to the strongest I'll probably have it the day before salute. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do that this year. Mm. <laughs> that was that was too hard. That was too hard uh, with the print copy that we were, we were discussing earlier. Though I was saying earlier that the um, um, when we I promised to release the print copy of To the Strongest at Salute, and it only arrived the day before uh, from the printers oh. after after I had a few troubles with the printers. Uh, that was very very stressful. So I'm not going there again. Yes. <laughs> plenty, plenty of time this year. Be plenty of time. I do remember that day because uh, I met you on the Friday on on the setup day for Salute. Oh, on the setup day, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You came over clutching the a pile of them like a like a proud father you were. Oh yes, I remember that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You were over with uh, with Greg and Beast, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. There, there, I always enjoy Salute. Yeah. There, there is nothing quite like feeling of a set of matching spines that you know you produced. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, it's uh, it is fantastic, isn't it? Jeans, but it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. No, no, I know exactly what you mean. It, it, it is fabulous, and it's lovely to see your name on the front of it, and you know, just feel that you've produced a really good, a really good product. So, um, so but anyhow, that's the plan. We need to get that out for. We need to get that out for salute. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, Andrew and I have been developing. We've we've developed quite a few scenarios um, for it along the way. Yeah. And the plan is to um, produce some sort of supplement um, with some historical battles in it, um, and also some of uh, a a sort of fantasy English Civil War campaign set in a set in the English in the county of Borsetshire. Oh, right, where, okay. uh, where a number of the a number of the scenarios that Andrew have written um, are set. Um well, I won't go into that particularly much, but they're they're very funny. Andrew has a very funny way of writing a, a scenario. Um so we'll need to get those out um, afterwards. Of course the nice thing about the English Civil War is there's no need for a, the same number of um I don't have to write 170 army lists for the English Civil War. <laughs> no, there's, there's only about three or four, isn't there, really? <laughs> yeah, we might get, we might, we might do a dozen. We might do a dozen, you know, for different theatres and yeah. whatever. But um, it's a very much uh, simpler endeavour. And, you know, the army list will be free. If we do a supplement, there might be a small charge for that. It'll probably be a PDF download. And after that, um, I need to think what I'm going to do next. Uh, can, can I ask a quick, quick question regarding? Uh, yes. so, so regarding, I mean, you were saying about, oh, you know, effectively a uh, a regiment. The regiment, yeah, well, a regiment. A battalion. yeah, battalion, battalion will uh, will effectively oh. cover ha, have a like a three square frontage uh, sort no, of no, thing no. ish. No, well, um, no, I, I can talk a little bit more about that. For for most, for almost all players. Uh, a, a battalion. Okay, so regiments could be very variable in size in the English Civil War. They'd often start off with maybe a thousand men, um, and by you know late in the late in the war, some of the Royalist regiments might only have a hundred men. So, on the battlefield, conveniently for someone writing a set of grid-based rules, um, they tended to combine the the regiments, to either divide the regiments or combine the regiments into battalion of around five hundred men. Hmm. Um, so that tended to be the standard size. So you might have 500 men of Rupert's blue coats, and then the other 200 men of the regiment are brigaded with 300 men from the Queen's regiment or whatever to form a second battalion and, and so forth. In the King of Parliament, it, it's generally one battalion per square. Right. Um, um, and a, a, a brigade might consist of four battalia led by a colonel um, or possibly by a general. Um, and there may be a more senior general in the army commanding a wing and a more senior general arm commanding the army as a whole. Um, we've got slightly more elaborate command structures um, in the King and Parliament than we had in um, To the Strongest because they were more complex during the English Civil War. Mm. And we wanted to accommodate everything. Sometimes a brigade might not have a colonel, uh, might not have a, a leader, because sometimes the it probably would have actually had a name leader, but he might have been so in- ineffective that he doesn't really count for game purposes. And um, so these brigades of typically 
two to six battalia of foot or three or four regiments of horse are the building blocks of the armies and you might expect to have two or three brigades under a single player's command um, right. quite often two quite often two under under a single player so you perhaps need eight or nine units a player to make for an interesting game now each of these units is in a square on its own you can have two units in a square but there are some disadvantages to that if um artillery shoot at you um then the artillery will fire upon both units so that's not a great thing um if one unit routes the other unit is more likely to be carried away in the route so again for this reason people will mostly have one one battalion to one battalion or cavalry regiment to a to a square yeah um the exception to this is for the the more megalomaniac player like myself who are building these really wide units that you can't really divide the table into one foot squares or you end up with too few squares on a table so (laughs) i've worked out a system where the megalomaniacs like me can have a regiment occupying two 15 centimeter squares um and it's oh hence why you need the eight by six mats (laughs) Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I need the eight by six mats. I'll, I'll probably need a couple of them. <laughs> so um, that's essentially the way the way that it works. If if people who have really big units, and you know, I know people. Uh, one of my friends had units that were thirty six centimeters across the front. You know that that isn't going to fit in a square in a single square <laughs> of um, in, in a sensible way. So you need to have a really you, you need to, we need to have a slightly different system which i've called extreme f cap but i would imagine 90 95 percent of players will play with these units fitting in a single square um and um a unit is a unit uh, there's no separate shots or from the pike it, it's one indivisible thing uh, in f cap so you don't have the, the shot wandering off and doing separate things to the pike they're always together as I think was generally the case in the English Civil War, although we've accommodated things like combined shots, you know, where you take a shot, surplus shot off and put them into a into an ad hoc unit and send it off to try and capture a wood or a village or something like that, where pikes are an inconvenient encumbrance. Oh, we've been, well, the other thing I, I should say about it is we've made sure that we capture all the troop types you're likely to need. So um, we've got um, um, Highlanders, We've got the various sorts of rabble that you might need. Um, obviously, dragoons. Dragoons play a big part in it. Uh, Forlorn hope. Um, oh, and we've looked at the different. You can have regiments of different compositions. So, you can have a um, a pike heavy regiment where it's fifty percent pike, fifty percent shot, or a shot heavy regiment where it's predominantly shot with just a, a slender few pike in the middle of the unit. Um, and those are all accommodated within the shooting and the combat rules in a pretty simple way. So you can model really anything that you encounter in the English Civil Wars. And also, um, um, we've been chatting with um, an American gamer who's very knowledgeable about the Celtic fringe, and we've kind of accommodated that. So if you want to wander wander off into Scotland and um, f- have fights between the clans or uh, Montrose, um, then you can you can do that as well. To be honest, the rules actually, you wouldn't need to change it very much to do to go away and do the later years of the um, Thirty Years' War. Um, and if you wanted to use the rules to go on and do something like Sedgemoor, um, they'd probably work very well for that as well. Uh, although I might do some more dedicated rules later on for the late 17th century, which is a really interesting period. Do you cover sieges at all? Uh... Because obviously no, that was that, that was quite a major factor in several of the um, in, in, in several of the battles, weren't there? We've got we've got rules for fortified buildings, yeah, um, and we've got rules to cover things like sconces, which I, I know there, were, there there was a sconce involved in at least one battle. You could also use the rules um, the walls. You could you could you um, you you could have an assault. Uh, let's say you wanted to do something like an assault on. Bristol. Um, I think the rules would accommodate that. But if you're talking about the siege where you could do an assault, but you wouldn't, the rules don't accommodate doing a protracted siege over a yeah, period sure. of two or three weeks. 
okay. um, yeah. with um, you know softening up the target with artillery, but they would help you to do an assault. So they're, they're battle rules, really, but they, they they accommodate those bits of a fortress or buildings or a village that you might find on the battlefield. Mm. No, I, I mean, no, I was, I was, I was just thinking it, uh, uh, the walk up the road to Litchfield Cathedral is, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a really interesting, you know, it's really interesting around there because, uh, cause, you know, as you walk along, you still got, you know, the stonework still bears the scars of ricochet cannon oh, shot and all sorts yes, of stuff. Yes. It's, it's, in, it's incredible over there. God, really that, good. I know. I, I remember as a boy going up to Winchester and I think, Winchester Cathedral was used to stable uh, Cromwell's horse at some some stage, and I think there were still bullet marks in there. And of course, the the roundhead smashed the great windows, uh, which they pieced back together willy nilly afterwards. Uh, rather sadly, they're like a obviously they, they hadn't done a lot of uh, uh, jigsaws when, when they put that back together. It was all very <laughs> random, put back together. Uh, yeah. Sad, sad to see that sort of destruction. But yeah, certainly you could. Um, Again, I think like the ancients, most battlefields are generally fairly open, but um, there's there are very likely to be hedges on the flanks. Sometimes a lot of hedges, depending on where you're fighting, uh, or stone walls. Um, and you know we've covered everything in the terrain rules. There's also um, a similar um, terrain setup system. Um, if you if you want to play a little uh, competitive game between a couple of players, you can. Um, set up terrain in the same way that you can into the strongest. Oh, we've got scenarios and we've got generals with different personalities, um, which are quite entertaining. It's quite a laugh. I mean, it's not a it's not a system that takes itself too too seriously. There's there's a yeah. fair bit of humour in there. I like to think. So um, yeah, it's coming on really well. Um, Good. They were just working at the moment this week on doing the combat examples, and then I think after I've got the combat examples written. I'll need to make generate the diagrams. That'll probably be the next thing. Um, then at some point, um, I'm going to be furiously trying to finish painting figures so that I can um, uh, take photos because we'll need to illustrate the book. Um, and I've got some innovative ideas for um, how we might present it. It might look a little different to the average set of war games rules. But the jury's still out on that one. Um, that sounds intriguing. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I, they, they might look a little different, or they might not. I might, I might bottle it. <laughs> <laughs> so coming out at Salutes, um, we, I guess with some new products. I should say I've done some, um, I've done some new bases for people that want to do the same, who want to base for extreme F cap, i.e. the big units of yeah. like forty odd figures. Um, I produced. Uh, my friend Ian, Ian Notter and I produced a series of bases that sort of lock together. Um, oh right! Um, for that, um, with you know, I, I do all my bases with the regular edges. Yes. Um, um, it's a thing I do because I like that. I don't like straight lines on base edges because they, I find them. I like um, I like an irregular edge because when you flock that properly, it kind of disappears into the table in a way that. A straight line doesn't. A straight yes. line is a straight line. You see it. I just want. I don't like to see the edge of bases. So, my my budget bases all have irregular edges and slope down to the table. And recently, I've started flocking the edge of the bases as well, which is a a thing. And you can't actually see the joins where the bases join together. For my own collection, I'm basing infantry units in blocks of twelve. So, twelve pike in the center, twelve shot either side, and a command stand of about six or seven figures in front with usually three flags. Um, and it looks really good. Um, there are some pictures. I have a blog, if anyone wants to look it up, called um, For King and Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, you just we'll, type in For King and Parliament. Right. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. King? I've got three or four infantry battalion finished and some very nice dragoons. And tonight I'm finishing... Uh, it won't finish tonight, but tonight I'm working on basing the um, Hesselrig's Lobsters, Hesselrig's London Lobsters uh, in there. Um, cuirasses uh, of um, uh, blackened iron. Uh, they're, they're, they're a fine-looking regiment. They really, really do look good. Um, that's my first regiment of horse. Um, but I should have about a thousand figures for salute with a bit of luck. I have got a thousand figures uh, painted. Um, I just only have about a third of them based so far. So right. I'll have a long way to go. And hedges too. I have some exciting ideas about hedges. 
when I do my hedges, if I haven't done in time for salute, they will be like hedges you've not seen before on a war game stable. Oh, that sounds intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a magazine piece uh, in these. This, they're only at the concept stage so far, but they're going to be quite unusual, these hedges. Uh, but I won't say any more for the moment on those. Right. So it's all coming along really well. It's been a been. I suppose I've been working on it for fourteen or fifteen or sixteen months now, and it's nice to think that there's only about six months more, well, less than six months left now um, mm. to to complete it, and then I'll be able to move on and look at new things. Now you're asking about the fantasy set earlier. Oh, um, well, yes, you mentioned it <laughs> in passing. <laughs> I got a, I got a bit of that done, and I was quite enjoying it. And then I got distracted by the English Civil War set. I will at some stage return to it. I used to love the um, that Hordes of the Things um, system, yes. um, yeah. the DBA like Richard Bodley Scott um, system, um, and you know. So I know it's possible to write a really good generic fantasy set, and I may well return to do it at some point. But I think the most likely thing to happen first is. Um, this rewrite that I mentioned of um, of uh, the ancients and medieval set to incorporate the new Renaissance set, and after that, hopefully, to the strongest will be will be kind of done. I don't plan to, re- I, you know, obviously I'll carry on supporting it, but I, I think it'll have, oh, I think I'll have taken it about as far as it needs to go yeah. um, with the second version. Uh, and that second version, as I say, it's probably at least twenty one months away. It certainly won't be. It, there's there's a way to go before it's done. Yeah, um, I won't really know until I get stuck into it. I have got some text written for it already, uh, obviously based around the original set and a lot of the new ideas for it. I'm testing out in uh, the even stronger supplement for, to the strongest, so it may not take as long as I I fear. Things always seem to take about twice as long as you expect. I guess that's real life interfering interfering with it, but um, uh, yeah. Um, after that, maybe fantasy. Who knows? Who knows where? Who knows where the winds of wargaming will take me? What, <laughs> whim, I should say, whims of wargaming is is more like it. Whatever yeah. snazzy army I buy, I made the mistake of picking up some um, very nice um, late seventeenth century figures off uh, Mister Imry uh, in Scotland, and they are beautiful. Oh. And uh, uh, I, I definitely feel a little temptation to do some armies for that. <laughs> also for the also for the war of the spanish succession which would be a bit of a scary thing i might i might try not to do a collection for the war of spanish succession i just think i don't think my house has any more room for something like that yeah that way leaves madness yeah it's getting a bit full of war games figures i, I probably have at least i think i've got at least ten thousand ancient figures now mm. um painted and based and another four thousand painted but not based you know i, I have a basing queue for, you know, it took me a couple of years to get everything based that I already have painted, two or three years. So uh, I probably ought to um, yeah, keep it, churning away at the ancient stuff. So yeah, I know you're. I know you're one of these people who have major shares in the really useful box company. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, and I have I have them scarily stacked up in my dining room now, with without places to put them. When they go away in the in my hall from the recent event, I've got sixty boxes stacked up in my hallway from the event last weekend that I haven't managed to put away yet. Mountains of mountains of boxes, boxes full of figures, boxes full of deep cut mats, boxes full of bases. There's, there's loads of stuff here. <laughs> there's loads of stuff. <laughs> it really, really, really is bad. <laughs> it really is bad. <laughs> I, I don't know quite what I'm going to do. I, I could do with uh, about a week. If I had about a week just to do put the stuff away, I could probably reduce everything to a certain certain sense of order. But <laughs> when, when do I have a week? If anyone's listening and uh, obviously don't have to the strongest, um, um, drop me a line. You can just uh, um, if you search for the um, if you Google Big Red Bat Shop, that's the shop that's got the rules in it and the hmm. um, deep cut mats I sell. I sell deep cut mats. Because people find it convenient to buy gridded mats. Uh, funny enough, I've been selling a few. I think quite a few people that are playing Rommel have been buying mats recently. Because I noticed that people are buying the mats that haven't bought the rules. So mm. I'm assuming that quite a few people are using them for 
for um, Rommel. Um, yes, because you um, are quite a, you, you are quite a useful UK distributor for that sort of thing, aren't you? Yeah, I think the the, the advantage, I guess, I, I think I sell them for around about the same price um, as as Deep Cut do. Um, but I guess it's a little bit cheaper from a point of view of postage. And if if the mat's in my shop, it means I've got it in stock. So um, you don't have to wait for it to be produced and dispatched and whatever. So I can usually get a mat out on the day or the, the day after an order's placed, and they're usually there the next day. So I'm pretty good at instant mat gratification. <laughs> if, you, if you need a mat for that game, that game on uh, Friday then drop me a line tomorrow and tomorrow morning and I'll have it in the post to you. So, um, yeah, it's quite a, that, that's been quite an interesting thing. I, I, I do sell quite a lot of them. I, I import and sell quite a lot of the mats um, from them. Uh, and I've had some designed as well for particularly, um, I, I had a Western desert mat design for sort of Alamein uh, looking mat, which has been quite popular. Oh, um, right. And another mat, which I called Sagebrush Step, which is good for... Um, Ancients games, um, you see it on quite a lot of the things on my blog. What else? I'm going to say it's my kind of winter quarters period, really, where I try and lock myself away for uh, until salute to do basing and write rules. Um, but I'll be at um, obviously I'll be at Chalgrove um, in um, February and um, uh, at salute, and then uh, I'm sure I've got I'll do another gig. We're talking about doing another big event at the War Games Holiday Centre in at the beginning of June this year. I think it's the around about the 1st of June. Um, that's a good one to see. Then next year I'll take the English Civil War game round some of the events. Um, in fact, I'll probably take it to most of the events. Um, so that will be at um, Partizan, um, hopefully Harrowood, um, Selwig, we'll, we'll certainly have you Newbury. Yeah, 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 that will be a good time to come because um, it'll be a it'll be a really good looking game by then. I mean, it's I've been lucky enough to buy some exceptionally well painted figures um, that I'm currently rebasing. That that they really are. I'm not the greatest of painters. I'm good at basing. I'm good at collecting, but I'm not a great painter. But the, I have managed to buy figures from the very best painters <laughs> this time so it should look like a, it should be a stunning army it's, I mean, you just look at the regiments with the big bright flags waving around in front of them it's just incredible um i hope to see some of you at some games um next year as i say if you've got any questions you can always email me and my email address is on it is in the about me section of the uh, big red black shop um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I spend a good portion of every day chatting, which is why it takes me about two years to write a set of rules. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for having me on the show. And um, I'll hope to see you all at a, uh, um, a War Games event in 2018. In, brilliant. Well, so, yeah, so Simon, thank you very much for coming on. English Civil War was uh, one of those periods I'm thinking, uh, I, I haven't got anything for English Civil War. At all, and yeah. and uh, and so, yeah. If you wanted a, a a nice set of rules to kind of get you into the period, I'm thinking, yeah, this seems, uh, yeah. <laughs> they were they're very playable. Yeah, I you think I'm sold. Agree. <laughs> that and Warlord Games Pint and Shop Box will see you sorted. In fact, yeah, yeah. Well, funnily enough, I was uh, I was actually more thinking I was actually more thinking along the line of uh, Mr. Berry's rather than I settle six mil um, English Civil War figures. But you always do. Well, yeah, um, this is it. You yeah. see, but yeah, 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 because we've done to the strongest in six mil, so we've got yeah. a couple of mats in that. So yeah, we've got a couple of yeah, three by two mats, and it, and it works really nicely. So you know, cool. Well, okay. as I say, Simon, it's 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 it's, uh, it's fan- fantastic to uh, to uh, to have you back on the show. Uh, I, I always try and catch you at shows. Sometimes it's not always possible because you're in the middle of uh, uh, of marshalling yeah. troops in in <laughs> one huge game or another. Yeah. <laughs> yes. usually there's usually, a, there's usually a phalanx uh, somewhere on the table, isn't there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's usually Harry Sidebottom hovering around. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, well, it's been great coming again, and yeah. uh, we mustn't leave it so long. I'll try and uh, I'll try and produce my next set of rules much more quickly. 
Superb. No, 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 I'll, uh, we could. We, we should have a chat. Uh, we'll have, we should have a chat in a year's time, and uh, even if it's just a bit of an update, I'm sure there will be some battle stories to tell by then. Oh yeah, that um, would, that would be cool. You know, for King uh, of Parliament rules. That would be cool. Well, Simon, thank you very much for coming on and telling us all about the King of Parliament. We wish you all the very best with your uh, with, you, uh, with your basing marathon. And, Based uh, on, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and we shall look forward to, uh, to seeing the rules of the new year. Thank you very much. Cheers all. Bye. 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 We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you are, would you like to support us? There's a couple of ways of doing so. You can become a patron of the show by supporting us on our Patreon page. There you can give regularly every time we produce a show. Alternatively, you may want to give a one-off donation, and you can do that by using PayPal. For more details on both these options, please click on the Donate tab on our website www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk I don't know if you remember, but there was a while ago, um, several years ago now, when I put on my blog one of my long-term ambitions was to actually fight every battle that took place on british shores oh i remember that and the one thing i was missing out of all that was the english civil war oh that solved that problem then hasn't it i'm thinking (laughs) no yeah i'm thinking oh i mean other than the fact yeah other than the fact of yeah let's Shall we just sweep the rest of that under the carpet? Because it's like, how far are you away from achieving that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How many battles have you actually fought? Have you got past... Um, I've done some HRO. ...fight each other with sticks and mistletoe. Have you got, have you got as far as Mons Grapius? I think we've done Mons Grapius. I think uh, we did it in Commander Colours, I think. Uh, Battle of Lincoln? No, we haven't got that far. Uh, Hastings? No, we, no, no, we have, uh, no, we haven't got to Dark Age oh. yet. No. All right. So, so there's all those lovely little, lovely little badly documented skirmishes. Yes, and uh, between uh, most of them fought on Doggerland <laughs> before it sank. However, unrealistic that that ambition was, uh, the one hole I had was English Civil War. And I think that game, especially with the fact that they're turning around and going, oh, you know, you can make your units up, you know, so your, your combined, uh, pike and shot units are, you know, you can just basically make them up and they, and they will cover a single base. I could just see that working so well in six mil and it'll look really cool. (sighs) Yeah. Just don't put your hand down on a pike block. No. No, that way lies pain. Yeah, but uh, I can see that as I can see that as a way of for me of getting into English Civil War. <sighs> that way lies madness, Mister mm. Berry. I need to have a chat with you at some point because he does make exceedingly good six mil um, English Civil War miniatures. They are incredibly pretty uh, at that scale. Anyway, yeah. yes, moving on. I have to do, do an apology. Yes, because during the interview, I I mentioned that um, I listened to a podcast which mentioned about troops running away to the nearest flag, and then to the next nearest flag. Uh, yeah, I had completely the wrong battle. The battle I was talking about was the Battle of Warren Warringen in twelve eighty eight in Cologne. Absolutely nothing to do with the War of Spanish Succession. Well, there I was, you go. I was four hundred years out. <laughs> 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 What's four hundred years between friends? Yeah. This is what happens when you listen to audio books and podcasts of, of different periods of time and they all sort of blew into one in your head. Occupational hazard of, yes, uh, of being a period slut, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Yes, it all blends into one. It's at the point where you have Normans driving around in panzers that you've got to really got to worry about it. But there we go. Mr Whittaker. Hmm. Has your Battle of Britain turned up yet? Well, there by hangs the tail. <laughs> was it in the front so garden? Got... 
Uh, so I got a message from the Kickstarter, well, from Anita, from PSC on early middle of last week, saying we have tried to deliver your Battle of Britain Kickstarter reward twice, and it's been returned to us. Oh, good old UPS. UK Mail. UK Mail. Because apparently they had twi- tried, lies, twice, lies, and left a card, lies, twice, because nobody was in. Lies. There was somebody in, I think, every day they might have tried to deliver. If there wasn't someone in the house, the builder was working in the garage, who I trust pick up post. And so, yeah, um, whoever's our UK mail contractor at this end of town in Peterborough, um, not impressed. Apparently they reshipped it um, per my instructions to work um, either yesterday or the day before. So hopefully when I'm wandering to get into the office tomorrow, it should have turned up. Otherwise I shall be having a small sense of human failure at UK mail or instructing PSC to do one on my behalf. On a positive front from PSC, they yeah, Battle Group Market Garden is shipping. Mm. So, so I shall be looking forward to getting a copy of that. Yeah, I'll get that one. I haven't got enough shelf space for Mythic Battles, you know. Well, I don't think any of us have. <laughs> I, haven't got I probably have, but all of that's got to come down and Blood Rage has to go, I think. This is the problem This is the problem I've currently got with uh, sorting my spare room out. You're like, where the heck am I going to put everything? <laughs> Uh, and on that note, um, yeah, yes, uh, I think it's I think it's time for us to go. All that remains to be said is uh, thank you to our resident troubadour. Thank you, Mister Whittaker. You're welcome. Uh, did you bring cake this time? I forgot to ask. Um, there was a very nice chocolate cake baked baked for experimental purposes, of which more later. Did it have vegetable in it? Uh, yes, because chocolate is a vegetable. Yes, bean. Comes from bean, grows on a tree. Vegetable. Yep. <laughs> so, yes, on that grounds, yes, it was a very, very nice chocolate cake, which was being made for experimental purposes and uh, passes passes the necessary tests. Excellent. And I think there's a slice of a very, very nice apple and lemon tart left, which I'm going to have once I finish the podcast of Jimmy and I not eat it. Thank you once again to our very own Welsh wizard. Thank you, Neil. How many biscuits were dunked during the making of this podcast? Oh, thank you all. Um, none. No, I, I just had a, a pint and a half of apple and elderflower juice. Well, say hello to Mr. Statton for us. I will. We shall have to negotiate which which podcaster will be the first one to get the Welsh Wizards on onto their show. <laughs> yeah, Jay's pushing for it. <laughs> But you're ours. You're you're our, you're our, you're our wizard. We got you first. Oh yeah, I I I would only go on to fight the corner of meeples and miniatures. Uh, thank you once again for coming on, and thank you for sharing your copious number of words with us. Thank Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, Love Jeff. You later, mate. <laughs> and um. <clears throat> Finally, Obviously thank you. Phloxine... G- give me another five hours, right? And I-, I reckon I'll be I'll be sorted. Phloxine... No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, thank you one and all for listening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show, and we will catch up with you again in a couple of weeks' time. Preferably without just hitting the pronunciation guide on Wiktionary, obviously. I didn't know that was me. (laughs) Because it sure as heck wasn't me. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk And you can also visit our webpage where you'll find a complete episode archive all the View from the Veranda podcasts rules reviews and our blog of hobby items and news which is updated several times a week This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media and here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group 
And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.